Simone Signore was not only one of her country's best loved film stars, but also as Signore had studied English and Latin in Paris, she was also considered the quote, thinking man's sex symbol. And this moniker was reinforced by Signore's literary endeavors, including her work as the translator of Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes from English to French. Signore was also a published author with a particular admiration for William Faulkner. Her memoir, La Nostalgie n'est plus ce qu'elle était, was published in 1976 and translated into English as Nostalgia Isn't What It Used to Be, published in 1978. And her historical novel, Adieu Volodia, was translated into English as Adieu Volodia, a novel uh, published in 1986 by Random House and it was published shortly before Signore's death. Married to another icon of French stage, screen, and culture, uh, Yves Montand, for over 30 years, from 1951 until her death in 1985, Signore weathered Montand's highly publicized affair with Marilyn Monroe, then married to Arthur Miller, after Montand and Monroe starred together in Let's Make Love, 1960, directed by Georges Cukor, and a 2011 play, Marilyn, by Sue Glover, explored the complexities of the friendship between the two women in an imagined conversation they have while having their hair dyed uh, by the hairdresser, the same hairdresser that they shared while living in adjacent bungalows in the Beverly Hills Hotel during the summer of 1960. And Signore discusses this period in her memoir, Nostalgia Isn't What It Used To Be, saying, quote, every Saturday morning, the hair colorist of the late Jean Harlow would board her plane and arrive in Los Angeles, where Marilyn's car would be waiting for her at the airport and would bring her to our kitchenette, and then the hair dyeing party would begin. And of Monroe, Signore wrote, she never knew to what degree I never detested her and how thoroughly I had understood the story that was no one's business but ours, the four of us, Miller, Monroe, Montan, and Signore. Too many people were concerned with it during troubled times when many more important things were happening. And this alludes to Simone Signore's political activism. She was a very staunch political activist for left-wing causes throughout, throughout her life. And she died in 1985, more than 20 years after Marilyn Monroe passed away in 1962. And Signore was survived by Montan, who passed away six years after her in 1991. An iconic figure of French cinema for more than four decades, as well as a writer, as discussed above, and a political activist for left-wing causes, Signore has a distinction of being the first woman to win an Oscar for a non-US film production, receiving the Best Actress Prize for her role in the British film Room at the Top, uh, 1959, directed by Jack Clayton along with the Oscar for her powerful and sensual performance as the married tragic figure Alice Aesgill, who was killed in a car accident after her younger lover, Joe, abandons her for another woman his, his own age, Signore was recognized with Best Actress Awards from Cannes Film Festival, the National Board of Review, the, the BAFTA, British Academy of Film and Television, and after Signore's Oscar victory, two more French actresses went on to win Oscars, Juliette Binoche, who received Best Supporting for The English Patient in 1996, and Marion Cotillard, of course, as Edith Piaf in uh, La Mom, La Vie en Rose, and she was named uh, Best Actress for a French-speaking uh, for a French-speaking role. And Signore was actually again nominated for a Best Actress Oscar, as well as a Golden Globe for the 1965 drama Ship of Fools, where she starred as a drug-addicted uh, Spanish countess. Signore's birth name was Simone Henriette Charlotte Kaminker, and she used her Catholic mother's maiden name of Signore rather than that of her Polish, Jewish, French born father, because she began acting during the Nazi occupation of France, often uh, in small, often uncredited roles in films including Marcel Carnet, Les Visiteurs du Soir, uh, The Devil's Envoys in 1952. However, Less than 10 years later, Signore would star as the titular adulteress slash murderess in the Carnet's Silver Lion winning film Thérèse Raquin, which is uh, adapted from, from the novel. And although perhaps uh, best known in the United States for her historic Oscar win, Signore's legacy is evidenced in other ways as well, in particular her political activism, along with her husband Montan, for left-wing causes including the anti-war uh, movement, 
Montand and Signoret starred in The Crucible, Les Sorcières de, de, Sal de Salem, directed by Raymond Rouleau, which was a cinematic adaptation of Arthur Miller's The Crucible, a stage play which, although set during the Salem witch trials in the American colonial period, was actually an allegory for McCarthyism and a, made a strong anti-McCarthy statement. And Sartre wrote the screenplay for Les Sorcières uh, de Salem, adapting Miller's theatrical work for the screen. And Signoret actually won the BAFTA Award for Best Foreign Actress for her performance as Elizabeth Proctor, the wife of John Proctor, played by Montand, both of whom in the film are falsely accused of witchcraft. And the actress and writer uh, Catherine Allegre is Signoret's daughter from her first marriage to French filmmaker Yves Allegre. And Yves Allegre uh, directed uh, Signoret in several of her early films. In particular, and in Yves Allegre's poetic realist uh, Dédé d'Anvers, or Woman of Antwerp, Signoret gave her breakthrough performance as the titular character, the prostitute Dédé, playing opposite uh, l'immortel Marcel Dalio as her pimp and uh, Bernard Vier as the bar owner. As in Dédé, uh, throughout the 1950s, Signoret frequently incarnated uh, femme, femme fatale, the femme fatale and prostitutes in noir and uh, popular films, uh, gangster films, including Allegre's Manège or The Cheat, in which she was reunited with Blier. And in Max Ophel's period piece La Ronde, set in turn of the century Vienna, Signoret again played a lady of the evening. And she also, that same year, starred as Denise Vernon, the former lover of a gangster in Frank Tuttle's classic noir, A Gunman in the Streets. And two years later, Signoret gave one of the performances of her lifetime as the eponymous protagonist of Jacques uh, Becker's tragedy, Casque d'Or, uh, Casque d'Or here, or Golden Marie, 1952, set again in the criminal milieu of Paris, this time at the fin de siècle. In this doomed love story, Signoret inc incarnated the role of Marie, who is known as Casque d'Or, or Golden Helmet, because, as you can see from the image of her iconic unmistakable helmet-like blonde uh, updo. And here she's a gangster's girlfriend who falls for a carpenter, uh, Georges Manda, played by Serge uh, Reggiani, uh, newly released from prison. Their love is not to be, as the film ends with Manda's execution for the murders of Marie's boyfriend and her boyfriend gang's boss. And Signoret received a BAFTA uh, award for Best Foreign Actress for her performance. Moreover, Casque d'Or is considered one of the most important movies in the history of French cinema, and Becker's uh, chef d'oeuvre functioning as a key transitional work situated between the French tradition of quality and the new wave, uh, which soon followed after Casque d'Or and upon which it had a really profound influence. And in 1955, Signoret also starred in uh, the critically acclaimed noir psychological thriller uh, Clouseau's masterpiece, his sordid masterpiece, Les Diaboliques, as Nicole, a teacher who is the mistress of the school's headmaster, uh, played by Paul Maurice, and Nicole plots along with um, the headmaster's fragile, pious wife to murder him. And Diabolique uh, greatly impacted Alfred Hitchcock's 1960s Psycho, and actually Hitchcock himself wanted to direct uh, Diabolique, uh, Les Diaboliques, it's uh, Diabolique uh, in English, and this film was also remade in the United States by Jeremiah um, Chachik as Diabolique in 1996, which was not well received. I don't know how many of you are familiar with their US remake. I, I see nodding. Yes, you're, you're familiar with it. Or, yeah. and, uh, yes, oh, okay. It was a big flop. It was a, right, exactly. So, and it starred Sharon Stone. So Sharon Stone played Signoret's role in the, uh, in the US version uh, with Isabel Adjani as the headmaster's wife and Chaz uh, Palminteri as the headmaster. So as the leading female character of Mathilde in uh, Jean-Pierre Melville's L'Armée des Ombres, Army of Shadows, and we did briefly touch on Melville this morning uh, as his birth date of 1917, we recently uh, celebrated his, his centennial. Um, so uh, a bleak and uncompromising portrayal of the French resistance during World War II adapted from Joseph Kessel's eponymous quasi-autobiographical 1943 novel, and also inspired by Melville's own resistance activities, as Melville himself was uh, part of the resistance, Signoret gave a powerfully understated performance as a woman who sacrifices herself for her family. And Mathilde, at the helm of a resistance réseau, is seemingly unstoppable when it comes to evading the enemy due, due to her many disguises and false identities, 
and her fierce loyalty to her fellow, fellow résistants. Yet when her, uh, when her daughter is threatened by the enemy, Mathilde must denounce her resistance colleagues in order to save her child. And for this, she pays the ultimate price, which is death at the hands of her former comrades. Spoiler alert, pardon me, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, arm, I'm sorry. Army of Shadows ending with Mathilde's assassination by a gunman in a Paris street, which is an incredibly powerful uh, scene, overdetermines its harsh outlook on and depiction of the realities of resistance, uh, resistance and collaboration in occupied France. Rather than upholding the idealistic myths surrounding that dark and complex episode of French history, a terrain which is still not completely explored. Signore returned to this subject in one of her final performances when she narrated the controversial documentary uh, Terrorists in Retirement in 1985, which shed light upon a small group of former French resistance fighters, primarily Eastern European immigrants to France, living in obscurity in Paris, having never received the full recognition for their acts of valor as part of the immigrant workforce sharpshooters and partisans combat group during World War II. And shortly after Army of Shadows, uh, Signore starred with Jean Gabin in Le Chat, The Cat, uh, the 1971 cinematic adaptation of uh, Georges Simenon. And uh, in The Cat, and here uh, I'm citing Christian uh, Janssens, in The Cat we find Gabin for the last time alone with Simone Signore as they are sequestered behind the closed doors of a home scheduled for impending demolition. For their performances in this harrowing film as a longtime married couple, no longer speaking, for whom the husband's beloved cat becomes the object of the wife's extreme jealousy leading her to commit an act of violence against it, Signore and Gabin were both awarded the Silver Bear uh, Best Acting Awards at the Berlin International Film Festival. Now, as she aged, S Signore continued appearing on screen in some of her most prominent roles not only without altering her looks, but also openly accepting or embracing the process of aging. In a 1978 article, she is described as follows, as you can see on the screen, quote, it is clear that Signore isn't what she used to be. The smoldering temptress of Dédé d'Anvers and Les Diaboliques is gone, replaced by a thick set, worn woman of 57. Her face is lined like a map of the Tour de France without a trace of makeup to disguise the years. Her wayward hair is flecked with white. Oh my goodness. So that's a quotation you can see um, on the screen. And Signore herself stated, I think I used age pretty well. I didn't cling to an appearance that would have been artificial. I got old the way women who aren't actresses grow old. And in Signore's own words, in her memoir, Nostalgia Isn't What It Used To Be, she wrote of her choice to embrace aging naturally without the intervention of plastic surgery, saying, quote, it's miraculous when life brings you parts that seem to grow better each year, stronger, laden with the memories of personal experiences that have put those lines on your face. They are the scars of the laughter, the tears, the questions, the astonishments, and the certainties that are also those of your contemporaries. For most women, these scars are the enemy. They try to track them down, turn them away, or erase them. And she also said, quote, for the stars, those scars are killers. They creep stealthily in prior to the expulsion from the garden of dreams. However, unlike most women or the film stars of whom she speaks here, for Signore, quote, those scars have been allies or possibly even alibis. When I talk about the lines on my face as allies or alibis, I mean that the aging process has helped me pass through a number of toll gates and that my lack of corporal discipline has furnished me with alibis. And in this end of, end of citation, end of quotation, in this respect, as Susan Hayward notes, quote, as Signore herself asserted by acknowledging that she was fat and ugly, she had the very alibi that would enable her to play fat, old, ugly, but interesting women as she did in La Vie de Vansois, or as we know in English as Madame Rosa, in, the, in her role as the aged prostitute Madame Rosa, who is the titular figure of Mizrahi's cinematic adaptation of Romain Gary's Goncourt prize-winning novel, for which Signore won her only best actress, César. And Mizrahi's 1976 film 
is based on um, Romain Gary writing under the pseudonym of Émile Ajar, uh, his prize-winning novel La Vie de Vansois about the love between Madame Rosa, an old Jewish former prostitute, and an adolescent orphaned boy, uh, Mohammed, also known as Momo, uh, she has brought up, as, as we have uh, discussed this morning. And the character played by uh, Simone Signoret, Madame Rosa, is described as follows. Madame Rosa, born and raised a French Jew, a self-described agnostic, is at once, is a once gouty whore who was the toast of a few streets of Paris, but who has been inactive since her release from Auschwitz at the end of World War II. To make ends meet, Madame Rosa now runs a kind of makeshift boarding house in her cramped six-floor flat in Paris's Belleville Quarter, a working-class district where Algerians, Black Africans, Jews, and Gentiles live in a harmony dictated by necessity. Her boarders are the offspring of her friends and former associates in, quote, the life. And according to Vincent Canby of the New York Times, this was one of Signore's, quote, best roles in years, one that uses the extraordinary physical presence she has become without exploiting it. And I know this morning we had, uh, we touched upon the physicality of this role, how she's limping up the stairs of her walk-up apartment and, um, and, and, and this is very much uh, very integral to this role. And of aging on screen, Signore stated, quote, it isn't courage, it's a form of pride, possibly vanity, to show yourself as you really are in order to better serve the character that has been offered to you as a gift. And I really want to touch upon, uh, upon this, this notion of this character as a gift. I mean, we're, we're speaking about Signore kind of all this negative attention that has been drawn to her looks as she aged, but yet she encountered really some of her best roles of her career, of her life, as, as she aged and as she grew older and less, let's say, conventionally you know, attractive or, or refusing to attempt to stop the process of aging. And this notion of the gift is very important. And indeed, according to Signore biographer Patricia De Mayo, for Signore, the role of Madame Rosa was a gift. Di Meo cites Signore, who stated of Madame Rosa that, quote, a role like that comes every 20 years. It is a cake. She, Madame Rosa, is everything. Liar, sincere, gourmand, poor, stupid, intelligent, warm, nasty. And she dies on top of that. If I had said no and another woman would have played it, I would have been sick. And, and indeed, in fact, Signore's aging was perhaps nowhere more noticeably on display than in the role of the titular Madame Rosa. Of her performances, Madame Rosa, uh, Canby further wrote that as played by Simone Signore, Madame Rosa is a tremendous character, an overwhelming mountain of worn out flesh whose arteries are hardening, whose ankles are weak and whose lungs are less dependable than a couple of ancient inner tubes. Madame Rosa is tired. She's in the process of dying, and she's afraid, not because of what comes after death. She's tough enough to face that, except sometimes in the middle of the night, but because of what will happen to her last boarder, a solemn, old for his years, Arab boy named Momo, played by Sami Ben Yub. Momo is one of her abandoned boarders, as little by little the other children are picked up by their mothers and placed in other refuges, Momo stays on because he has no place to go. And Susan Hayward finds that Madame Rosa's physical infirmities, her mind and body are worn out. Her body is bloated, her heart the subject of her heart subject to the effects of hypertension and her mind suffering from senility thus suggest that her body is a totem to history, albeit worn out by the impossible weight of this history. And in fact, Signore played Madame Rosa as such a, quote, tremendous character, as had previously been uh, noted by Vincent Canby, that in Hayward's, esti Hayward's estimation, Signore's presence as Madame Rosa, the aged prostitute, ends up by giving her character a greater role than that of the original text. In the film, there is a role reversal in that Madame Rosa becomes the stronger presence, whereas in the novel, it was Momo who dominated. 
And critics argued that director Moshe Mizrahi was so taken with Signore and somewhat in awe of her that he gave her prominence in her role as the old and ugly woman she portrays. And in fact, they went on to work together again uh, later. Uh, uh, Mizrahi and Signore did work together again, where she also, um, in the film Cher Inconnu, where she played a, a similar role of an older woman trapped in kind of a very lonely and desolate uh, life, uh, caring for her, uh, her disabled brother, and who ends up being really abandoned um, in life. And in terms of Madame Rosa, Hayward further claims that Signore worked extremely hard on the role. And in it, she became some kind of totem to history, which is why she came to occupy such a dominant position in the film. In the role of Madame Rosa, Signore's aged, aged, bloated, and limping body, as we mentioned the limp uh, earlier this morning in our morning sessions, the limping Madame Rosa is the first image we see of her as she limp, limping up, up the stairs, becomes a body as totem to history, which is worn out by the impossible weight of this history. There is nowhere else for her to go than to hide. Physically, she, but holding up in her secret refuge under the stairs and mentally by entering dementia, a withdrawal that ends in her death. As Madame Rosa, a retired prostitute and an Auschwitz survivor who now ekes out a living by running an unlicensed daycare for the children of prostitutes in a small apartment in Belleville in Paris, which was then an unfashionable district as opposed to kind of uh, the trendy, uh, so it was a very unfashionable district, unlike the trendy neighborhood it has become today, uh, Signore gave a tour de force performance. For her portrayal as for her portrayal of the elderly, hard as nails, victim of life, haunted by the trauma of the Holocaust, who forms a close quasi-maternal bond with one of the children in her care, who we also discussed uh, this morning in uh, Professor Bullock's uh, wonderful uh, paper, Signore was awarded the Best Actress César. Madame Rosa received the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film that year. Uh, thus, as um, Hayward notes, the year 1978 was big for Signore. Her success with La Vie de Vensois being matched only by her success with her autobiography, which I, I, uh, with which I began my discussion, Nostalgia Isn't What It Used to Be, which was published that year. Hayward further observes of the success of the film Madame Rosa that, quote, clearly the film struck a chord on the political as well as the personal level. As an American review of the film at the time noted, in the climate and the country that saw President Carter acting as a professional referee in the bout between Begin and Sadat, it must have been a natural Oscar contender. Yet despite Signore's statements in her autobiography and elsewhere about the benefits to her career as an actress, of growing old naturally on screen and her seemingly radical decision to, quote, get old the way women who aren't actresses uh, grow old, as I cited uh, above. As noted uh, in a New York Times article, there were several reasons why Simone Signore did not, initially she did not want to play the titular role in Moshe Mizrahi's film Madame Rosa including that her husband, Yves Montand, as, as, discussed, uh, as, as I previously discussed, Yves Montand urged her not to portray the ailing, frowsy, frizzle-haired old whore. The part in the film is indeed a watershed for Miss Signore, who is best remembered as a smoldering French sex symbol, whether the titular characters in Dédé d'Ampère or Casque d'Or or Nicole in uh, Les Diaboliques, and in this same article, Signore is quoted as saying, uh, to accept being 10 years older than you are, and Signore was in her late uh, 50s when she portrayed uh, Madame Rosa, who is um, at least 10 or a septuagenarian, wear the worst costumes, the least flattering makeup, be subjected to camera angles that make you look bigger if you're big, swollen up if you're puffy, it was a big dive for me. Uh, so, I mean, she, it's true that she did speak about radically embracing aging or radically accepting it, but at the same time, it really, she does acknowledge that it was really difficult to, be, to appear this way on screen. And since, as Eric Pace observes, Signore's sensuous face 
with its full lips and heavy lidded eyes, was immortalized on screen in her portrayals of what Patricia de Mayo calls young and beautiful femme fatales to the svelte woman of the world with earthy sensuality that made sex appeal and glamour seem superficial and trite. And in fact, in order for Signoret to get into character as Madame Rosa, technicians would make her look grotesque for this role with padding that increased her girth, hair that frizzled, and a face aged beyond her years. They permed her hair into a kinky bob of curls, covered her legs with padding carefully wrapped in ace bandages, mm -hmm. and stuffed cotton into her cheeks to puff them out, to fill them out. And in addition, and as we noted earlier today, uh, Simone had to limp for the role of this former prostitute who had once been beautiful and useful, and had been in love, and had even been in love, but now struggled with her weight, a heart condition, and a hardening of the arteries that pushed her unexpectedly into catatonic states or caused erratic and irrational behavior. And uh, here is, she wore outrageous house dresses with large floral patterns that accentuated her weight, particularly since the dresses didn't fit properly, purposefully didn't fit properly. She chose the dresses for this role, and she bore the burden of sheer ugliness without complaint. And as the journalist uh, Catherine David suggested, there was little doubt that Simon was also consciously putting finishing touches on an anti cascadeur image. So you can see this, it's complete, if we look, so sh this is really the anti cascadeur If we um, look back at, again, uh, Madame Rosa, uh, in comparison with Cascadeur, uh, Madame Rosa, really, this is how I, I bracketed this, this presentation or this uh, consideration of Simone Signoret's Signor, career, really just these two roles at the two opposite extremes. And as, as Di Meo observes of Signoret, while she did not age gracefully, her transition to the aged matron, wrinkled, fat, and formless, was almost seamless on screen. And Haywood also reminds us that during the 1970s, Signoret actually used the loss of her looks to her advantage, taking on roles as older women. In fact, she starred in 13 films, which is nearly a third of her star performances as a mature, even old woman who had lost her looks. And she asserted agency over her own decline, which is really worth uh, considering, in, in fact, and, and that Signore did go on to star as another uh, middle-aged woman in a later film directed by Ms. Rahi, Cher Inconnu. This concept of uh, asserting agency over her own decline, this kind of recalls, sort of opens a parenthesis or recalls the kind of uglification of women actresses winning the Oscar for Best Actress, which has been kind of occurring recently in recent times, such as uh, Halle Berry in Monsters Ball going without makeup. I mean, beautiful actresses, Charlize Theron, you know, gaining a lot of weight or again winning also for Monster. And Nicole Kidman also donning a prosthetic nose and kind of so beautiful actresses really renowned for their for their appearance, uglifying themselves and, and receiving critical acclaim. So this is something that, you know, Simone Signore really and as previously mentioned, uh, Madame Rosa earned the Oscar as Best Foreign Film for 1977, and the César for Best Actress went to Simone in 1978. And with the recognition and continued success of her autobiography and also her critical acclaim in these roles, um, Simone Signore was fascinated uh, by this unexpected peak in her career, according to uh, Patricia de Mayo. And here's uh, a quotation from Signore herself. When I was young and beautiful, I never appeared on the cover of a magazine. And now, at 57, I am on the cover. <coughs> Suddenly, there is this infatuation with a not-so-young woman. It is ironic. But, according to de Mayo, it pleased her that she was still appearing on screen in major roles at a time when her contemporaries struggled. And this really, we, this is very relevant to today when we think about ageism in Hollywood, uh, continued uh, ageism as a problem for female actresses, let's say over 40, and the dearth of, of important roles for them, the dearth of, so th and this is a constant uh, discussion and dialogue, especially coming up now with Me Too and Time's Up and everything. So this is really something that is, is, continues to be very relevant and 
She had no, however, Signore really had no shortage of film opportunities um, as her aging on screen, prominently um, aged on screen, and beyond showcasing the shocking and accelerated on screen aging of Simone Signore, the actress who incarnated the character of Madame Rosa, the figure of Madame Rosa becomes, in Hayward's estimation, the site of the history of the persecution of Jews and Arabs. As a victim of Auschwitz, a prostitute, and a maternal figure for the Arab boy Momo, she is three times a female body written <coughs> upon with her concentration camp number, uh, which came up uh, earlier today with our discussion of uh, Marceline Loridan Ivans in uh, Chronique d'un été by uh, Jean Rouche, sexed upon as a prostitute and finally depended upon as Momo's, quote, mother, and as such is a totem to, respectively, political, sexual, and cultural history. And one such example of how Madame Rosa symbolizes or becomes a totem to political, sexual, and cultural history is in that, quote, Madame Rosa incarnates the past persecution of Jews during the German occupation of France. <coughs> Moreover, she embodies that time with a strong degree of iconic specificity in that, as she tells us, she was first rounded up and taken to the Ville d'Ive and subsequently sub deported to Auschwitz. She also, however, incarnates the contemporary, 19, contemporary for the time, the 1970s, Arab Jewish problem and the attempts to broker a peace between the two parties. In an era when racial tolerance as a discourse was not high on the political culture agenda, Madame Rosa leads through example. As she says, whatever your origins, what really counts is the ability to love. The love between her as an aging Jew and Momo, an <coughs> adolescent Arab, stands as a testimony to the potential for harmony between the races, and we did speak this morning of love in terms of the trauma of uh, the World War II uh, cinema and also melodrama, so this really also ties into uh, a very strong uh, theme that's uh, elucidated or illustrated throughout uh, the film Madame uh, Rosa. And in incarnating an iconic range of female characters in French film spanning the spectrum from Casque d'Or to the anti-Casque d'Or Madame Rosa, Simone Signore was undoubtedly, in Eric Pace's words, a, quote, recurrent image through four decades of French movies, becoming a sort of symbol of her country's post-war film renaissance. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This slide here, thank you, thank you so much. And this slide here, uh, again, sort of illustrates a uh, quotation from her that, um, it might actually be a form of vanity to show yourself as you really are, to sort of bear your soul, bear your aging uh, face, bear your aging um, uh, body, face, and uh, mind, and everything to, to the world. And so I, this is also an important uh, citation from uh, Signore herself. So. Thank Any you. Comment? Thank you very much.